Okay, well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you uh, to uh, this webinar. Um, as some of you may know, I am Michael Diamond. I have the privilege of serving as the academic director for the integrated and marketing communications programs within the division of programs in business that is in the New York University NYU School of Professional Studies. And um, we offer uh, a two degrees, one in master, a master's in integrated marketing and the other a master's in PR and corporate communication. And I'm uh, very proud to uh, name among our faculty, Ken Kerrigan, who has joined us today um, uh, to talk about his, his wonderful book. And I will say unabashedly, I, I, I guess I didn't get a chance to be quoted on the book cover, but I would say unabashedly, uh, this is a wonderful book and I, I really strongly recommend it to any of you on the call. Um, a few housekeeping things. Um, we will go probably, Ken and I, for about 35 to 45 minutes in, in a dialogue. Um, and then we will, uh, you know, pause uh, to sort of review some of the Q&A in, um, in, in, in the Q&A that you're given. So if any of you want to ask questions, uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with the protocol now. Uh, we're all a little uh, Zoom have Zoom fatigue, but at the bottom of your screen, you should see two speech bubbles, and those speech bubbles uh, say Q and A. So, if you have a question, if there's something you want to ask, then the the best way to do it is to pop the question in the Q and A, and I will be monitoring that, and I'll make sure to sort of pick up the themes if if it if if it feels to me we haven't covered those issues already, um, and then also. You know, and this is a conversation about PR and public relations and thought leadership and uh, et cetera. But, you know, I'd also like to try and ensure we keep the conversation focused on those things if we can and, uh, you, you know, uh, encourage uh, participants to moderate their own questions and, and comments. So, you know, that's uh, just so we can keep it focused and thematic. So, so that's my sort of broad preamble. Um, uh, we, we have a nice healthy number of people joining us today and uh, I welcome everybody. Uh, the, the participant count will probably keep climbing for a little bit, so I'm not entirely vamping, but uh, let's, let's kick off at least. Um, and, and can I, you know, I obviously want to welcome you again. Um, it's just always an enormous pleasure uh, to be in your company and, and, and chat with you. Uh, and now we have a really good excuse, because uh, as I said, you've published this uh, wonderful reflection uh, on, on a career and a life and an industry in PR. And uh, so, so, so thank you. I'm really pleased that's sort of brought us together. Um, I, I want to ask you, uh, and you kind of curiously describe yourself in the book as an accidental PR professional, which I thought was just a wonderful phrase. Um, and, and so I thought maybe you could start off by telling us a bit about the path, uh, you know, that got you where you ended up, which is a position of, of uh, extraordinary leadership and, 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 and influence in, in the PR industry. So it's how, how did that, how, what, what, what happened? What was the accident that got you here? Yeah, oh, sure. I'd be delighted to first. Thank you, uh, Michael, for the kind words about the book. Uh, that does mean a lot coming uh, from, from someone like you. And thank you to everybody at NYU for uh, putting this event uh, on for us and for all those that are out there in cyberspace watching us. Thank you for attending. So I guess the, the very first line in the book is actually, uh, I'm an accidental public relations professional. Um, and what I mean by that is I had no intention of going into a career in public relations when I first walked through the doors of New York University all those years ago. Uh, my intention actually was to be a lawyer. Uh, and I was taking classes in pre-law and constitutional law was uh, seemed like the route I was gonna go down. And then somewhere along the end of my sophomore year, I met with an advisor to the law school uh, who looking at some papers on his desk sort of burst out in enormous laughter. Uh, and I paused and I said, did I miss the joke? <laughs> What's happening? And he said, well, my God, have you looked at your GPA? And I said, not recently, why? <laughs> he said, you probably should, uh, because I don't think you're going to get admitted to NYU law or frankly, any law school. And I said, but you know, hey, I'm a first generation college graduate or will be, uh, I'm, I'm working uh, pretty much full time down on Wall Street. So that obviously is hurting my GPA. And he said, I don't care. Um, so one advisor led to another and that led me 
to sort of stumbling uh, into a potential major in communications with political, a good dose of political science on the side. Uh, and it honestly was a wonderful adjunct instructor. Uh, so, you know, you know, hee ha for the adjuncts out there. Uh, I mean, Angelo Parra was my first public relations instructor. I still have the notebook from my class. Uh, and he made me realize that this was uh, the road I wanted to go down and introduced me to some of the founders like Ivy Lee and Bernays. Um, but the the real accident that I think set the career was I, I got my first agency job a few years later and had my first performance review. And in that review, my my boss at the time, whose name I shall not uh, mention, uh, said, Ken, I consider you to be a fraud and a failure who will be found out at any agency you go to, large or small. And we'll meet again in six months, not to discuss if you're getting a race, but discuss if you still have a job. Uh, and bleary-eyed, I sort of walked out of the office and walked down Fifth Avenue through Washington Square Park back into the, the Bob's library and found myself on the same floor uh, where I've been so many times the, the two years prior where they keep their public relations books. And I accidentally stumbled on a book by Ed Bernays called Your Future in Public Relations. And I was struck and took it off the shelf and said, if only by the, the prescient title, it's so odd and accidental that I would find this book today. Uh, and in it, Bernays outlined uh, his you know, list of criteria for the public relations professional worthy of the name. For those of you who don't know Bernays, is, Bernays is widely considered to be the father of modern day public relations. Um, and as I looked at it, I realized, honestly, most of what I learned as an undergrad uh, that was very tactical uh, weren't even on Bernays' list. And that began to explain to me as I read the book on the E-Train going home, uh, maybe that review has some merit to it. I'm not quite the superstar professional that I thought I was as a snarky undergrad. Uh, and that would lead me over the years uh, to, to grow and then to get my master's uh, at Newhouse. Uh, which was actually 20 years ago today, um, or, or was it 21 years ago? I think it's 21 years ago today. Um, and uh, where I met you know, great leaders who really served as mentors and uh, helped me become the strategist I am today, which is also a happy accident that you meet people in a classroom. Uh, one of them was Dr. Terry Flynn uh, at McMaster University. It's his birthday today. I think he's watching, so happy birthday, Terry. And uh, Terry also became uh, my faculty advisor uh, as I wrote my capstone paper which was called Our Future in Public Relations. Uh, and after I presented it, he pulled me aside and said, I thought you always said you were gonna write a book. Uh, this is just a PowerPoint presentation. What happened to the book? Uh, and that inspired me to write what's now available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and bookstores everywhere. So that's sort of the accident <laughs> in many no, well, I. I think, uh, you know, I think for many people listening in, you'll also get a flavor of a, what a wonderful storyteller Ken is. And, and you know, that's suffused throughout the book. Uh, probably one of the skills that uh, has made him so successful in, in PR. And, you know, sort of full reminder, Ken was an EVP at Weber Shandwick in charge of corporate reputation and, and, and issues of trust and, and, and advised many senior clients. I, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, we're still winning awards, even having left uh, Weber Shanwick. So, um, you know, really a, a person that sort of ascended from uh, whatever that poor performance review was to positions yeah, exactly. of, of, and it's a good, uh, it's a good reminder for all of us. Uh, and on another occasion, I'll share a similar story, but it had some expletives deleted. So, um, but anyway, <laughs> I. I think in addition, uh, you know, and I, I'm sort of enthusiastic about this book, as you guys can tell, but in addition to being a great storyteller, um, Ken is really also a very astute historian of PR and, and, had, and did, the, you know, did the hard work, frankly, that I think sometimes authors don't do uh, of, of hitting the stacks at uh, Bobst and, and working, I, I imagine, with Shelley Spector and her colleagues at the Museum of PR is a fabulous uh, institution, uh, you know, uh, in, in New York. And we're also proud to have Shelley as one of our instructors and mentors for our faculty, but uh, for our students. But you, 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 you probably are the best person that I might ask this question, which is, when do you think PR became spin? Uh, you know, when, when did it sort of take on this reputation as, you know, spin meisters, the spin doctors? Was it always like that? Well, I, th I think it depends on your point of view. Uh, so you can look historically at a point of time where in uh, public relations and spin 
sort of became running on parallel tracks. And that was really when the profession was born uh, in, you know, the beginning of the 1920s. So a centennial, one of the premises of the book is that I think the profession is celebrating centennial. And we saw a spin in particular with America's entry into World War I um, and the creation of the Creel Committee. Uh, and you, you saw leaders of the day like, you know, Walter Whitman coming out and saying, these people should not be put in charge by the government of communicating with the public, uh, but they deal in misinformation. There was a, you know, rather inflammatory story that the New York Times wrote uh, at the very beginning of America's involvement in World War I, where the Creel Committee uh, suggested that the Navy had successfully sunk a, num a number of German submarines. Uh, and that was simply not true. Uh, and it led the Times to call the committee the Committee on Misinformation. Uh, and had George Creel, uh, you know, widely attacked uh, somebody who was dealing with an untruth. Uh, sort of, if you look at today's decade, you wonder, like, so that was the beginning of so-called fake news. Uh, yet it was a century ago. Um, I personally don't think that spin is always bad. I think it's been around forever. Uh, spin is really the human instinct of how you tell a story, a position, uh, your facts, which is not alternative facts, but the facts as you see them in a persuasive way to try and get a stakeholder or the public to, you know, accept your point of view. I think you could say a trial lawyer talking to a jury is practicing spin uh, or, you know, trying to, you know, convince friends to go to the movies with you uh, because you think they're going to have a good time is the practice of spin. And, you know, some of my students have seen uh, my car, which is a you know a Camaro. Sometimes it's parked outside the SBS building back when that wasn't a bike lane. Uh, and the license plate of my car actually is Spin Doctor K. Uh, so I am not one to run away from the word spin, uh, but I think it's incumbent on the profession that we don't allow the profession of public relations uh, to fall onto this rabbit hole of spin being the equivalent of manipulation and lying. Uh, and that's a, a separate conversation that maybe we'll get into in this dialogue about the lack of ethics and the enforcement of ethics yeah. on PR professionals that allows bad actors to truly spin and make up their own facts as George Creel did, uh, perhaps well-intentioned to support public sentiments in uh, America getting involved in the war. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's actually, uh, you know, a lot of what you said to sort of begin to unpack and, and build on is, is a great segue. Uh, one, one, one thing, and I think it's great context setting and, you know, shameless promotion, and maybe you call it spin, but uh, Ed Bernays, who we've been speaking about, you know, sometimes the, the father of PR, uh, we're celebrating a centennial because in 1923, uh, mm -hmm. it was, he actually delivered the very first university course in something called public relations in America at NYU. So I think NYU can be justly proud of being part of that history. But, you know, Bernays is also probably, uh, you know, I guess along with Lee, uh, one of the more quotable, um, you know, found, founding, uh, founding fathers or founding minds of the industry. And, and, I, and he said something, and I will, I will uh, you know, glance at my notes because I want to get it right. It was just, you know, so interesting. And you quote it in the book. Uh, he had a book called Propaganda, and that's probably a whole topic in itself. But, but you know, he had, a, he had this very memorable description of a PR professional or someone. He said, the people who pull the wires that control the public mind, mm -hmm. yes? And so I guess the question I have for you is, you know, um, is PR a force for good or is PR a force for evil? And, and isn't it essentially the same skill sets either way? So, you know, how, how do you... How do you develop the skill sets, but how do we ensure that uh, they're used, uh, you know, reasonably and ethically? Well, well Michael, I think it's an excellent point. And, you know, sometimes when I read Bernays' writings, I look back saying, you know, there is a PR counselor in need of a PR counselor. Uh, and that he, you know, viewed the profession that he, he felt he created uh, so much as a science and a social science. Uh, that he often would use terminology uh, in his writings that are somewhat scary uh, and weren't meant for the general populace to consume. 
And I think that leads a lot of people today to vilify Bernays as sort of this master manipulator and spin doctor, if you will. Uh, I do think you're, you're entirely right. Um, the profession of public relations does have the power, and has a great deal of power, first of all, but it has the power to promote evil and the power to promote great good. Bernays himself would sort of oddly express shock and dismay uh, after World War II to learn that a lot of his, you know, framework of the practice of public relations was actually embraced by Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany. Um, and I refer to that in the book saying, how could you actually be shocked by that? Uh, you knew this was going to happen uh, because the public is easy to manipulate. You look at the Lincoln quote, you can fool all of the people some of the time. And we'll just take that part of the quote. As long as you can do that, uh, well, you can be very successful if you're fooling people at least some of the time. Uh, and that gets back to the ethical construct of the profession. And it was Lee, not Bernays, uh, who was the first to outline his Declaration of Principles, uh, where he said, here's what public relations will be as practiced by my firm. Uh, and what he succeeded in that declaration was the communications I send out will be in the public good and should not be confused with advertising. If you think that it's advertising, ignore it and send it to your ad department. Uh, but I'm disseminating information on behalf of my clients that I think should be part of the public discourse. That's as far as he went. He didn't condemn people uh, who send out public discourse information that's, that are untrue, um, but he set up that first found, you know, foundation of ethics uh, at that turn of the 1920s, at the beginning of this, you know, what I call the centennial of the public relations professional. So we did have a core of ethics to start with. Um, but I think at some point it's easy to lose sight of that, especially when there's no risk involved. Uh, anybody can go out there and practice the social science of communications uh, and do so to cause great harm. We're seeing that you know, all over social media today. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I think for many of us, you know, some of it is not as uh, explicit or as 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 active as you know a desire. That, that we feel companies have a desire to cause great harm, but there does seem to be some disparity between companies' actions in terms of sort of doing the morally right thing um, and, 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 and trying to sort of, uh, you know, uh, companies doing the right thing, even perhaps when it wasn't in their business interest to do that, to do that thing. And, and you have a number of really good examples, I think, in the book, in, including the famous you know, Tylenol case study, which is, you know, often taught and referenced, but where companies, um, where a company actually did the right thing, you know, notwithstanding the huge impact on its, its business operations. Why, why don't companies do more of that? You know, why is this that, why do we have that gap between, um, you know, doing the right thing for the morally right reasons and, and sort of getting tied up in other business concerns and considerations? How do you, how, so, you know, what's the gap that leadership needs to close? And then maybe just segue into this idea of, of, of what role you think PR uh, can play particularly in helping that. Yeah, so I, I think we're, we're living at an interesting time. Uh, and it was, it was one of the reasons I wrote the book uh, when the sort of light bulb went off saying, we have this moment of a centennial for the profession, a chance to look back at where we've been uh, where we started, where we've been, and where we might be going, uh, with that philosophy exactly in mind. So, oddly enough, uh, you know, two days ago, August 18th, marked the one-year anniversary of the now infamous letter from the Business Roundtable, uh, signed by 181 CEOs, stating that stakeholder primacy was now going to outweigh the importance of the Milton Friedman-inspired shareholder primacy. Uh, so, to unpack that more it meant these ceos are now saying doing the right thing for our stakeholders our people our communities our consumers our suppliers uh, was now at least equal and perhaps more important than doing the right thing just to jack up the share price which meant if i'm sitting there having a meeting in a boardroom saying should we close down this factory today uh, or should we keep it open to save this community safety shops we're probably now going to lean more into keeping the factory open, even though that's going to avoid that momentary pop in share price. Um, so that happened one year ago today. And I think there was a lot of pause and questioning, is this real? 
but I think some people saw this was, you know, that that shift happening. The Financial Times did, a, you know, a cover uh, on social capitalism as a, a wraparound cover, uh, and it stirred up a lot of conversation. Uh, but then, you know, 2020 happened, and we had the pandemic. And I think there we saw proof more than ever before of companies stepping up, uh, not just pandemics through this perfect storm, pandemic, Black Lives Matter, uh, sort of global discord and a lack of trust among stakeholder groups. And companies had no choice to act and to speak out on issues of the day and even address their own policies. And I think we saw this largely through the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and, and the pandemic of how we were going to treat employees um, and do the right thing in our communities. You know, giving money to the right charities was no longer just a nice to have philanthropic, you know, PR driven event, but was part of the DNA of organizations. I don't think we're going to step backwards from that, mainly because we have a new generation of consumers, both in the established millennials who now have, in theory, uh, disposable income when they're not paying down student loans. Uh, and the generation behind them of Z, uh, who has grown up, you know, with sort of utopian ideals about how the world is supposed to work. And we're already seeing the data where they're demanding change and action, and they're rewarding the corporate brands that get it uh, at the cash register, even if it costs them a little bit more. Uh, they'll buy shoes from, say, Tom's more than they might be you know, not to pick on any other brand, but say Acme Sneaker Company, just so I don't offend another brand. Um, and I think that's a very real shift and there's no escaping it. I don't think we're going to revert back. I mean, because it's the old axiom of follow the money. And when Larry Fink wrote his first letter uh, to the attendees at Davos two years ago, calling for this type of purpose-driven change, everybody paused and said, wow, uh, is the Fink letter really important? Was this a stunt by Larry to get on TV? But then he wrote another one before Davos last year. Uh, and he basically said, it's bad investing for, for me at BlackRock to invest in you know, entities that don't get that having a sense of purpose is the future. Uh, and when you're talking about trillions of dollars uh, coming from BlackRock and, and as long as Larry Fink's in charge, I think that's very real. And if the money, money talks. And right now the money is saying, you must be purpose driven. Uh, you must care about society. You must act on the issues of the day. Uh, staying quiet is no longer an option. Um, and I think PR has a great opportunity to drive that. Uh, we were talking about principles before. Uh, you know, the second wave of where meaningful principles sort of developed would have been on the corporate communication side in AT&T uh, when a man named Arthur Page uh, was in charge of communications. And Page is sort of credited like Renee's, you know, Page is the father of modern day corporate communications. And after his death, Colleagues of Page put together their list of his principles of how he guided AT&T from being a public utility to being a you know purpose-driven organization. And the first two Page principles are tell the truth, uh, and number two is prove it with action. Uh, and I think if those two principles are the only things that companies focus on, and that PR teams come in and say, "You have two things we need to do today: we need to tell the truth, and we need to prove it with action in everything we do for all stakeholders." this change is going to be very, very real and it's going to last for a long time. And that's going to be very empowering to the PR professional. Yeah. I, I, this idea of telling the truth and, you know, demonstrating through action, uh, you know, is, is definitely become very central to the discussion recently, you know, in, including, I think uh, some introspection from companies that were where the words were more than the actions. And, and I think even some of the companies that were, signatories to that business roundtable have been, you know, sort of, uh, you know, tasked or, or, or called to task with how well they're living up to the principles. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to me the idea of truth and action is, is, is as good a litmus test as any. It's also a good point to sort of talk about the nature of truth. And, it, and there's a whole discussion in your book, I think, a, a, an interesting one around Sort of fake news and the development of fake news and 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 the, and and where and where and how we can sort of um, distinguish between um, you know the fake news or the alternative facts and we had some questions indeed already around 
you know, uh, your point of view about, um, you know, the truth and alternative facts and, and how you make that distinction. So, you know, I guess my question is, you know, how does PR and maybe marketing more generally broadly reassert its position uh, that you would suggest, that, you know, its heritage was around truth telling and, and integrity? How, how do you see that moving forward? Well, you know, as the, the New York Times said in their, their, their ad that they ran just about a year ago, uh, truth is hard. Uh, and truth takes a lot of work to get at. Um, the one thing I would challenge is the old cliche that truth is in the eye of the beholder. Um, really, I think that's true with news, uh, but it's not. Truth is, you know, a very specific thing. It's not really subject to interpretation. Um, and I, I think a, a number of things need to happen uh, in the fiction. One, uh, is companies need to act with integrity in everything they do uh, and not think that they can, you know, pick half truths because it's, you know, you know, conducive to the bottom line. Uh, but I think here is where the media, you know, are becoming, are increasingly important and it worries me what's happening to them. Um, there have been 1800 newspapers that have closed their doors uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, right now, you know, just last week, we saw the Tribune Company say the Daily News and four other major dailies were no longer going to have operating newsrooms. Uh, reporters were somehow miraculously just write the stories from home. Uh, I find that difficult to understand how in a post-pandemic world that's actually going to happen. Uh, the outgoing CEO of the New York Times he sort of catch said, yeah, I can foresee a future where there'll be no more print edition of the New York Times. Uh, even Oprah. <laughs> Oprah is not going to print the magazine anymore because even Oprah can't sell and sustain the model of a print publication. Uh, and NBC started furloughing uh, reporters for NBC News last week as well. Um, and this has led me to the belief that truth doesn't exist in a vacuum, but truth also requires a financial backer. Uh, and the reason that the media is considered the fourth estate is it's their job in the marketplace of ideas to begin to shift and differentiate fact from fiction uh, and help us understand our truth. We may not always agree, and we'll all drift to various forms of media that are more in line with our you know, even political viewpoints. Uh, but truth has always come to us through the media, like the Creole Committee. It was the New York Times saying, you're lying. <laughs> you didn't sink any subs uh, that allowed for that truth to be known. And it worries me today that the, the public relations profession, the advertising profession, are so deeply invested in the land of social media uh, that now the Times is no longer, you know, can envision a point where it will no longer be a printed newspaper. Uh, Oprah can't sell magazines, Daily News has no newsroom. Uh, and that has led me often to challenge the profession. A couple of years ago, the, you know, the general counsels for Google, Facebook, and Twitter are all in front of the Senate. And, raised their right hand and Diane Feinstein said, you've created this thing called social media and it's spreading a lot of untruth uh, and you need to be the ones to do something about it or we will. And I look at that quote and then say, hmm, if we had the CEOs of Omnicom, IPG, WPP, maybe even Richard Edelman, uh, all sitting in their place in front of the Senate and you take out one word from Feinstein's quote and say, you fund it this thing called social media and it's out of control. And if you don't do something about it, we will. Uh, and I think what happened, and I saw it on the HD side, is that everybody went to their clients and the CMOs and said, you know, hey, I've got a great idea. Take all that money that would have supported you know, advertising and traditional media and supporting the fourth estate and paying the salaries of reporters, give it to us. We'll create this fantastic video that will win us gold lions at con. Uh, and trust us through this Google algorithm, we'll communicate directly with your consumers in ways you never imagined possible. Uh, and everything's going to be great. And from a sales and marketing standpoint, there's a lot of truth to that. Technology and Comtech, you know, have allowed brands to engage with consumers in, in, directly in ways never imagined before. But in doing so, we took so much bathwater out of the tub of truth that I worry that in this decade, we may say news as we've noted globally, especially in this country, won't be there anymore. 
and then truth literally becomes in the eyes of the beholder. And we're seeing that now uh, when it comes to you know, Edelman's trust barometer, the finding that people believe people who think just like them. Well, that's great if you want your truth to be consistent uh, and not be invaded by something called facts. And we're in that very delicate time right now where I think things need to happen. And I think the profession as a whole needs to step up and rise to that challenge. Can we explore some elements of, of, of that kind of bit, especially sort of the role of technology? Maybe uh, you, you segued, uh, you know, you were talking a bit about social media and, and perhaps the, the beast that we, we've created um, ourselves. In the book, I think there's a very healthy and interesting tension or internal dialogue about, uh, you know, how much is really new. Um, you know, so it's very easy, perhaps it's another form of spin for people to position uh, you know, new media or, 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 or new forms of communication as, as radically new or radically different. And you make an argument that, you know, by showing some very interesting um, uh, examples from the history of, of PR and advertising, how, you know, many of the things that we think about influencers, for example, et cetera, were, 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 were very common, have been very common to the practice. But so I, I want to explore the issue a little bit of this notion of what's really new and, and, and what's just old or old wine in new bottles. Um, Churchill, you know, who I'm, I'm, I'm fond of quoting and is, is really easy to quote, I guess, along with Oscar Wilde probably has as, as many good uh, quotes as, as you need for a webinar. But um, the, the, he made some comment, I think it was about buildings, you know, that first, first we make our buildings and then our buildings make us, you know. And I think that could be applied to technology or new media. You know, we, we, we've shaped the media, but now the media is shaping us. So, so uh, w what do you acknowledge is really sort of new space for PR where, you know, there have been radical shifts that PR hasn't dealt with in the past. And, and what do you think is more about, you know, pulling ourselves up by our socks, going back to first principles, whatever you want to call it and, 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 and figuring out a path forward. So. Well, you, know, you, you mentioned Oscar Wilde, so I'll come back with one of my favorite uh, Wilde quotes from The Importance of Being Earnest. Uh, and that is, Wilde wrote, one should never say one is a dentist when one is not, because it may create a false impression. Uh, and then all the fans of British theater, <laughs> Michael maybe being the only one, will chuckle and say, oh, I get that. <laughs> That's quite witty. Um, but I think that that gets at the public relations profession is that Somewhere along the lines, you know, all of these notions of marketing, public relations, that's not new, paid strategies, owned content, that's actually not new. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that. The medium has changed. Uh, but along with the change in the medium came a new flow of budgets and revenue. And I think that's where some, not all, but some of the profession uh, decided to pretend that there's something that they're not, meaning we do advertising, we do marketing. Uh, we are no longer public relations professionals. And that's where I think the profession begins to lose its way, or as Wilde said, create a false impression uh, in the boardroom, in the C-suite of what, they're actually, what their mandate actually is. Um, so stepping back of some examples, you know, we think this the acronym of PESO, paid, earned, shared, and owned, is the some you know, post-internet miraculous thing you know, dawned after internet 2.0. And that's simply not true. Uh, and one of my favorite examples was one I learned in that very first class uh, with my adjunct professor, Angelo Perry, in 19 something something. <laughs> uh, and it's mobile oil. And, her, and the, the, their head of communications at the time, Herb Smertz. Uh, and mobile was the most vilified company in corporate America uh, and was never going to get its share to tell its story in traditional media channels. Um, so he decided to do it on, him, on his own with own content, something that he called an op-ad. And he bought the lower right-hand quadrant of the op-ed page of the New York Times. And once a week, there would be a very well-written and persuasive, perhaps I, I dare say, spin-oriented uh, column, often written by him, about issues of the day that were of particular interest to mobile, but done in a way that still had journalistic integrity and were driven by the public relations mandate of telling the truth. It wasn't marketing material, it was not an ad, even though it was paid for. It was legitimate content meant to stir public debate. And in time, those pieces were actually read as, as important as other opinion pieces that were running in the Times that day. And it, it went on for nearly 20 years. I think what's happening today, sometimes we're creating content that's overly marketing driven. 
and we're losing sight of the fact that the content we create uh, has this PR, should have this PR mandate of how is this contributing to a more just society? How is this you know, communicating with our stakeholders what our point of view in the world actually is as it relates to our business? Uh, I think that's what's missing today. Uh, and you know, Tom Harris, you know, who was the co-founder of Golan Harris, he wrote a book in 88, I think, called Marketing Public Relations, uh, which I guess everybody's forgotten about because we, maybe we don't buy books anymore. Um, but everyone acts today like we're integrated marketing communications, just this newfangled idea. Uh, and it's not. But what I think needs to happen today is if I could take a genie in a bottle and say you have one wish, what could it be for tomorrow? I would say I want every website of every PR agency to take away the words integrated marketing communications. Uh, because integrated marketing implies that communications is a subset of the marketing function. And it's not. They're, they run parallel and they overlap in some key areas, but they're not, other than the fact that marketing may have a bigger budget. Uh, and I'd like to replace that word with collaborative communications. Uh, because, you know, for an entire enterprise, it's not just integrated marketing. Collaborative communications to me embraces a, a broader whole of marketing, traditional public relations, employee engagement public affairs, investor relations as this great ecosystem uh, of stakeholder engagement uh, that needs to work in harmony. And ideally have one person at the helm, and I frankly don't care if that's the CMO or the chief communications officer. Ideally it's the CEO, uh, him or herself at the top. Uh, but that is the shift that I think we need to see happen. And I think that's, uh, you know, broadly responsive to some questions we were getting, uh, you know, from the audience about, these distinctions between marketing and PR, and uh, you know, uh, and how to think about those two different fields and their unique contribution to you know biz business success. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll be proud to know that we've 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 shifted in our department away from the word integrated marketing communications, at least to integrated marketing and communication. So we mm -hmm. uh, we acknowledge the sort of dual importance of of those two two fields. Um, but it's clearly very important to PR people. And I, I wonder if you could just spend a moment talking about, um, y you know, how you see, I mean, let's do it in the context perhaps of if you were advising someone, you know, so you have a young uh, emerging professional is interested in career broadly in this space. And, and they say, you know, Professor Kerrigan, you know, should I go into PR or should I go into marketing? Is there a way to frame that conversation in terms of people's career and, and, and what, what you think the differences look like? Yeah, um, I think today the, the, there are intersections and I, I am not as sure as I once would that I would say that there are two clearly defined roads uh, for the impact that you can have. I think you can have impact on society in both functions because I think both are now becoming increasingly purpose-driven with a sense of social justice. We've seen that through large brand activations uh, with, with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, where brands stepped up and that didn't seem to be led by the public relations function. It was clearly a marketing decision. Um, I think the, the, the advice I would have for the next generation is don't sit idly by and quiet, bemoaning the fact that you don't have that so-called coveted seat at the table with management uh, and that you're left out of the conversation. And that for decades has been the lament of the public relations profession. Uh, we want this seat at the table. And they'll say, well, can you prove that what you did had any impact on the bottom line? Like, no, it's all intangible. We can't prove a thing. But we still want that seat at the table. And we're going to hold our breath until you give it to us. Uh, and they never got it. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think maybe because the profession was focused on the wrong things. Uh, and those were maybe tactical elements like, you know, publicity and media mindshare, which you know, at the end of the day don't necessarily mean as much as they once did. I also think that there's this, you know, rain cloud hovering that's been hovering over the profession since its very birth of ethics. Uh, and it's really easy. If you're the CMO, you know that there are rules about what thou shalt not do. Uh, it's called the false advertising laws. Uh, but in public relations, there are no such laws. There is no real meaningful, you know, accreditation. There's the APR exam, which I have, uh, but that doesn't necessarily have any teeth to it, unfortunately. Uh, and unlike accounting or law or you know any other discipline that may be in the boardroom, the PR discipline has nothing to back up that it should be taking seriously. 
uh, and Bernays to his dying breath, you know, fought for that. Uh, and, you know, as he neared his 100th birthday, he said, PR today is terrible. Uh, and any nitwit can call themselves a public relations professional. Uh, he's not wrong. And that's still true today. Uh, and I'm hoping the next generation will do something about it. So, so let's discuss a little bit about what that new PR looks like. And, you know, I mean, I'm interested in sort of some of the forces at work that you think, uh, you know, will emerge better from the other side, but also then, uh, you know, and I'll come back to it with a question. I, I want to just get some questions in about careers and, you know, very specific kind of uh, capabilities. So let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, maybe if we can dimension your, your vision a bit more about what this new PR looks like or this, you know, field of collaborative communications. How, how might that look different inside a, a company, do you think? I think the new PR, and there's been, you know, lots of research over the decades uh, where that phrase has been kicked around sort of, you know, in a tireless fashion. I think the future of PR is going to be one where, you know, it's this realization that public relations is a true function of the successful management of an enterprise. Uh, and what does that mean? Successful management of an enterprise really gets to this notion of stakeholder capitalism and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and it, it creates this opportunity for the, the, the new PR professional is going to have to be well versed in the language of business and business acumen. Uh, you know, my friends Ron Colpin and Matt Regis at the Paul University uh, were the first to write that book uh, on the importance of business acumen that a number of us use at, at the university. Um, but it's the ability to relate to the head of investor relations, the head of government affairs, things that, you know, in the past, you know, for the PR professional weren't in his or her swim lane were sort of decisions left to others. And if you want to be that corporate conscience of the enterprise, if you want to be that voice of reason in the boardroom, you need to be able to go toe to toe with all of them. And I think that has, there's, you know, some burden that's placed on us in the academic community is that we now need to train the next generation of leaders to be ready to actually have those conversations. Uh, I know I wasn't as I came out as an undergrad, I thought I was, uh, but that's why I was got that performance review that I did because I was not ready. Uh, I got ready, you know, once I got my master's, uh, which I strongly encourage everybody to do after you have a few years under your belt to go do that. Uh, but it took a long time of listening and being mentored and, and, and shaping points of view to get to that. But I think the, the problem is when we talk about new PR today, uh, too much, we say the new PR is a digital revolution. It's, it's all contact driven. Uh, there was a CEO of an agency who wants to talk to me a few weeks ago uh, and, and, and doing my research, he was creating an agency that was solely based on conducting media relations through algorithms and literally thought that he could call reporters and say, you should run this story because you're gonna get a lot of likes and shares. Uh, not that it was true or that it had value to their readers, um, but that people would like it. And he was using technology to drive that and basing a whole business model on. That frankly scares me. And that I think agencies today are looking for people with uh, you know, great skill sets and digital and AI. And trust me, those are resources that are important. Uh, but I go back to those you know, first guiding principles that Bernays laid out you know, over 50 years ago of the ideal professional. It was about integrity, keeping confidences like a doctor or a lawyer you know, understanding what makes people tick, having a broad world view of society and the world. Uh, and that's not what agencies are looking for. Uh, they're looking for all these, you know, digital solutions and, you know, whiz bang tools. And I've won an Emmy, therefore I should be a PR counselor. I'm like, no, you should be producing TV shows. <laughs> uh, that doesn't make you a PR counselor. Um, so I worry that there's two shifts. I have my definition of the future of PR uh, and it's running side by side of a definition that others are saying is the new PR. And the two maybe can coexist, but I think they're going to bump into each other quite a bit. It, it sounds it sounds like you think uh, places like you know NYU and programs like ours and and those that you know Matt and other colleagues Terry probably teach on and and lead um, you know should be playing a larger size role perhaps in the training of PR professionals then and you know I wonder 
you know, you, you have this interesting seat as, as an adjunct uh, at NYU, uh, but also someone who's very much in the thick of things, uh, you know, as a leading practitioner. What, 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 what do you think we might be missing in the university and, uh, you know, and programs in PR? And, 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 and what, what more broadly is the role that you think an academic group, you know, not just in its teaching function, but through applied research might, might play to advance some of these important themes that you're discussing? I think in, in, over the last decade, I think there's been a significant shift in the world of academia uh, to begin to focus on these, you know, more important issues. Um, and, you know, I'm gratified that, you know, while it's not necessarily great for us <laughs> and like you, that the competition is there and that everybody's trying to create something and eventually enough will get it right uh, that a real difference we made, you know, I'll be honest, the only reason I made my way up to Syracuse and went to Newhouse was because New York University didn't offer a master's. Uh, there were people in the school at the time who felt it was beneath the institution to offer a degree in communications. That gets to my point about PR always having that black rain cloud over its head that it got to the point where it's thou shall not be taught, uh, which is a sort, sort of a scary thing. But, you know, the first class I took at, at Newhouse, uh, Topic A was, oddly enough, diversity and inclusion, uh, and how that led to more excellent communications models. Uh, I look back now at 21 years later to today, uh, and I'm like, huh, how relevant was that class? <laughs> uh, and how ahead of its time in, in, in many, many ways. Um, and you know, kudos to you, Michael, and, and what, what NYU has done. You know, kudos to the, the folks at Newhouse and McMaster uh, up at Toronto. Uh, you know, the Tuck School of Business and my, my, my buddy, Paul Argenti, uh, you know, my friends in Chicago at DePaul, uh, I think are really now focused on the fact that this profession truly matters in society. Uh, and we need to crank out a generation of leaders, uh, even the, the, the Page Society. I give them great credit for investing in the next generation uh, and agencies who are willing to write the check to support their rising stars to get that training. Uh, because it's going to be needed more so than ever. And if the media, if all the, you know, the prophecies are right and traditional media as we know it today is going to become a thing of the past, if there will be no more print edition of the New York Times, uh, if you know, I could care less if there's no Oprah magazine, <laughs> that's just me. Um, you know, Richard Edelman, you know, a few years ago at the National Press Club uh, gave a speech where he talked about this new idea of his called collaborative journalism. Uh, and in it, he said it was going to be incumbent on business leaders to create content and, uh, with their stakeholders to fill the void that exists between a disappearing media landscape. Uh, and I remember looking at that time saying, <laughs> I'll believe that when I see it, when business leaders are so unbiased that they can actually act like they're in the New York Times, uh, that'd be a great day indeed. Uh, but the only way that can happen is for public relations leaders, uh, maybe an army of Richard Edelman's, uh, to be out there demanding of their corporate leadership that that's exactly the type of truth we're going to tell. Uh, I'd still prefer a print edition of the New York Times, uh, but if for business model purposes that's going to go away, uh, maybe there is this opportunity uh, for collaborative journalism, collaborative communications to actually work side by side and for truth to survive with a different kind of financial backer. Yeah, and I, I think actually the New York Times is a phenomenal case study um, I had an opportunity to get to know their CMO a little better recently, but, you know, and they just came out, I, I hope some of you probably saw a, a really beautiful new campaign in the, in the series that they have with Droga 5. Uh, but, you know, what's remarkable about the results is just how much that readership has now moved online and how many people, mm -hmm. you know, and I, it would seem to me, and maybe not worth arguing the rub, but it doesn't really matter to some extent, whether there's a print edition of the New York Times or an online edition of the New York Times. But I think what you're celebrating is, is, the, is the form of journalism and truth telling and, and the form of storytelling that, that, that you know, they, that they have arguably um, perfected and crafted. And so it's, we, we have a, you know, a few minutes left to, towards the end. I, I'm gonna ask you a sort of somewhat provocative question, which you know, I think maybe is redundant. Okay. Uh, because you've 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 largely answered it, I think, to my satisfaction as well. But you know, it does get asked: is um, is is PR dead? 
is it dead or is it dying? Oh. You know, is it, are we, are we, uh, you know, I, I worked just parenthetically, I worked in the theater for many years and still huge fan of the theater. And every year someone would say, is theater dying? You know, um, I'm sure it happened after the radio, after television. Anyway, so same, same, in the same vein, is PR dead or dying? <laughs> well, you know, there's actually a book uh, with that title, uh, ironically written by a former, keyword there's former, uh, executive from Edelman, he, was, he ran uh, their European operations, uh, and it's the title is ex exactly that: PR is dead. And of course, Bernays, you know, years before that said PR is horrible. Um, so, what is it? Uh, and that actually, you know, inspired the the, the cover design for the book. Uh, and you know, if you look closely, you know, originally, I love when magazines do the digital element and say, "Let's take you behind the scenes of how we created this week's cover." Uh, so I'll think about these things of how we created the cover of this book, because uh, it answers that exact question. Uh, originally, that circle with the hand holding it was a globe. Uh, and it was some artist view saying, you know, oh, the, we're talking about it. It's a global release. Therefore, it's the whole world and public relations. And I didn't like that. Uh, so I said, you know, let's scrub it. Let's just make it black until I figure out what to do. Uh, and then once it was made black, I said, that kind of looks like an old fashioned cartoonish bomb. Uh, and then someone else said, I think it looks like a bowling ball. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's skip the bowling ball. Um, and I called the artist, I said, can you put a fuse on top uh, and have it you know, twitching a little bit like it's lit? Uh, and they said, sure, give me 10 minutes. And they did it and that's the cover that you see before you. Uh, so the story that I'm telling on the cover design is that I think PR is not dead. Uh, I think it'd be wrong to say PR is dying, uh, but I do think we're at a point in time in the road uh, where there's trouble ahead uh, if we don't do something about it. And what we're holding as professionals right now, literally in our hands, is a ticking time bomb. Uh, and in, in a world unguided and unregulated by you know, true ethical standards, enforceable ethical standards, uh, and in a world fueled by money, uh, where we'll do whatever is going to make us the most money. Uh, and I know it's a broad condemnation of the we'll do, but in general, there's enough people that will that make it bad. Um, but I think the fuse is lit. Uh, and if we don't do something to put that fuse out, uh, then maybe PR will be dead. And that'd be in incredibly unfortunate. And it is the reason why I wrote the book, because you know, getting back to this notion of the centennial, I'd like to see a second hundred years or more of the profession. And I think there needs to be a real discourse uh, about where the profession's going uh, in this post-pandemic world. Ironically, it's a profession created after the last pandemic. Uh, it was, you know, the Spanish flu, you know, don't ask Trump when that was, because he'll tell you 1949. Um, but everything we know about what constitutes the modern day profession of public relations happened in the years following a global pandemic. And it, here we are again. Uh, and are we going to keep it business as usual or are we going to, you know, put out the fuse and figure out how we can more collaboratively work together, both internally with our communications brethren and marketing brethren and with society. Uh, so that the notion of business and society colliding in the current decade, that's going to happen. Uh, and companies who are ready for that and ready to engage in that way are going to survive. And those that aren't are going to be whatever happened to them. I, I think this is a, a wonderful point to draw this to a close. I, 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 uh, I'm still sort of uh, uh, processing this ticking time bomb in, 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 in our hands. And, uh, you know, I think it highlights for me that we all have enormous responsibility, uh, whether we're PR professionals or educators of uh, PR professionals or, or students aspiring to be PR professionals. There, there is clearly a um you know a very clear uh, you know there's there's a clear mandate that we all have and and a lot of the chat you know and some of the q a that we didn't get a chance to get to is really around you know how can pr become a much more proactive player in the discourse uh, you know most of the questions around politics whether it's here in the us or uh, outside the us uh, you know uh, arguably a force for good or or or, or a discussion around you know, uh, how we pass words and what language we use and, you know, how that, that becomes, uh, you know, opportunities to frame things which may be politically freighted or not. So there's, you know, clearly, um, you know, there's this massive pent up positive demand, I think, for 
uh, people who at their heart have this notion of integrity and truth and and doing things for the public purpose. You know, that the distinction I like from Lee is this idea that you act uh, as much in the interest as the public as you do the client, you know, and I, I think that's yes. a very powerful concept. So I, I want to thank you. I also want to shamelessly promote the book. I, I, my colleague, hopefully, <laughs> Uh, hopefully it's in the chat. He has put a link in uh, for a, a link that will take you, uh, I, I guess, to uh, the publishers uh, who have very generously yeah. offered anyone with such link a 30% discount off the, uh, off the book. Um, as, as I think I've been transparent, I, I think it's a wonderful book and I encourage you all to, to purchase it and absorb it and learn from it. But, you know, on behalf of all of us at NYU SBS, I, I do want to thank you sincerely, Ken. And uh, I know we'll see you a lot and our students will continue to benefit from your wise counsel and your experience. So on behalf of us all, many, many thanks. Thank you, Michael. And just a reminder, if you do go to the publisher site, NYU30 is the code that you need at checkout to get that 30%. Uh, and in terms of our future in PR, uh, I did make a personal promise to my dear friend Shelley Spector at the Museum of Public Relations that I would give her 10% of all royalties from the book because she was uh, invaluable in the creation of this book. Uh, so if you're buying it, you actually are giving something directly uh, to the future of our profession by supporting what Shelley's doing at the museum. So uh, if you can, please do, and you'll be uh, actually contributing to a, a noble cost in doing so. So thank you again for, everybody for tuning in. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that, you, that's extraordinarily generous of you. And I, uh, you know, I encourage everyone to, if they want to check out further some of our programs, uh, you, you'll Google NYU SPS Integrated Marketing and Communications, and you'll find us right there. And uh, you, uh, we invite you to join our community for those of you who are not already part of it. And everyone who signed up today will be uh, able to access additional content and uh, other wonderful uh, chats and conversations we've we've been able to curate. So many thanks from all of us. I, I'm going to leave us now respecting people's time uh, at one o'clock uh, and there's a big shift and we move on to other things. Uh, so many thanks for joining us today. Uh, recording will be available. Tell your friends and we'll, we'll get information out to them. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody.